Hey, and welcome back to The Clinch in this very special series of our features on One Championship. I was fortunate enough to sit down with one of my MMA heroes, Rich Franklin, who is, of course, a former UFC middleweight champion, but perhaps more importantly, the vice president of One, a position he's held since 2014. It's a wide-ranging and very open and honest interview with a former high school math teacher from Cincinnati, Ohio. We discuss the rumors of a return to competition, the differences between Asian and Western MMA, his journey from childhood, life as a Christian man in combat sports, and what makes MMA the greatest sport on this planet. He really gave me all the time in the world, and he was as an awesome individual as you would expect. So sit back and listen to one of the greats, Rich Ace Franklin. There have been talk lately about you coming out of retirement and going back into competing again. Did that come from you? Is it serious? Is there any, any meat to those bones? No, I, you know, I get, I get asked questions about coming out of retirement, and I always use, this is my, my standard statement. There's things, there's certain things that are possible, but they're not probable. And so, I mean, look, <clears throat> my passion is, is competition. And, I mean, clearly I've not let myself fall out of shape. I'm in the gym pretty much on a daily basis. And, uh, and so, but it's been several years since I've competed. And I realize that I'm over 40 now, so things have changed and whatnot. But, um, but no, I mean, you know, anything could be enticing with the, with the right opponent or, or you, know, the, 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 you know, the stars kind of aligning. Make sure, I'll make, make no mistake about it though. I'm not interested in any kind of uh, like Legends League. I'm not interested in I, like going for another title run. Like I, I, I don't think I could come out of retirement and string uh, a bunch of a bunch of fights together. I'm not like it's my, my body has got too much wear and tear on it at this point. So, but you know the right kind of super fight it could intrigue me. Possible, not probable. Well, of course, talking about wear and tear, you got your BJJ black belt uh, in 2014 under Jorge Gurgel, mm. and you've been rolling quite a bit with Matthew since. Is there possibly a BJJ tournament something you've been thinking about? Um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, look, I've never really, I've never really considered uh, doing any kind of BJJ tournament, and that's primarily because I've never really considered myself just a BJJ practitioner. Like, jiu-jitsu is just part of what I do in MMA, and, and, and quite frankly, like, once you remove the punches and, and those kinds of tools from the jiu-jitsu game, I'm a bit more restricted, and so, uh, so yeah, I'm just, I'm not one of those people who was groomed into, into doing jiu-jitsu, and quite frankly, uh, on the grand scheme of things, like my, my gi game is very weak, really. I, mean, I can admit that because I, you know, my competition, not, you know, in MMA you don't wear a gi, so I don't know, maybe though. Of course, we're here in Macau for one championship, Kings yeah. and Conquerors, and you, in fact, your last MMA fight ever was here in Macau. Does it bring back memories? Ah, no, I don't know. Not really. Uh, I mean, honestly, like, it was such a blur, and uh, and getting knocked out, you, you, I pretty much forgot about half of that week anyway. So, so no, it doesn't it doesn't really bring back any memories. And plus, I'm on. You know, I, I'll say this: uh, when I first started working for One Championship, I actually, um, I, I really did not enjoy coming to the shows because I would sit outside the cage and uh, I would get this feeling of anxiety as if I was competing, like every time you're at an event and it just kind of brings, it, it takes you to this place of where you've been. I mean, for the last 15, 20 years of my life, every event that I went to, I was competing at the event. And so it's very difficult to just go to an event and enjoy an event. Uh, and so I would sit outside the cage doing my job but with that same anxiety as if I was competing. And just a little, little by little, that, that went away with each show and I've gotten to the point where I realize I'm outside the cage kind of doing my job. And so that's probably why coming to a place like Macau really doesn't bring any memories, particularly bad memories or anything like that. But then with that in mind, don't you think as a former competitor, now that you're vice president, it gives you it, it gives you an insight into what the fighters and their families go through every day? Oh, absolutely. I think that that's one of the things I bring to the table uh, initially working for this company is that I have I have a wealth of experience in the MMA industry, um, but on top of that, you know, I come from a different background than most people do who are competing, so I can look at things from the perspective of the, the athlete or, or, or whatever, and I, and I bring that, I bring that, that variety to the table. Of course, you became uh, VP over three years ago now, I think it was April 2014. Mm -hmm. What differences have you noticed between Western mixed martial arts and Asian mixed martial arts in terms of the fighters, the fans, and how the promotions run? Uh, I, it's, let me, I, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll say this from, from an athlete perspective. 
The, the biggest difference between um, West and East martial arts is that in the West, you're pretty, pretty much only as good as your last fight. You, know? um, you won your last fight, people love you. You lost your last fight, people were kind of scorning you or whatever. Uh, in, in the East, like, you're kind of revered for, um, f you know, for, your, for the effort that you put into something and just the, the whole attitude of martial arts about becoming better every time. And so you may actually put on a great show but come up short, uh, but the fans don't look at you as like, oh, well, you lost your last fight. And so that's, that's kind of your legacy or whatever. And, and that's the biggest difference that I notice. And I think that that kind of just trickles over into a lot of different aspects of culture, like respect and, and and you know we throw around words like integrity and stuff like that, but I think respect, which is a big, a big, um, a big catchphrase in martial arts. You know, it's one of those things. Like when, if I send my five-year-old son to learn karate, it's because I want him to go learn respect. You know, but it's a it's a very deep-rooted concept in martial arts in the East, and, and so those things it, it plays a major role. How has the journey been for you then for the past three years? What's it like living and working in Asia as an American? Uh, I, I mean. Let me say this. Um, first of all, like life has just been a crazy journey for me. I mean, I was this kid that graduated from a very small high school outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. We had cornfields on three sides of the high school, and um, and and I went I went to college to study uh, education and mathematics, and, and I graduated and planned on teaching high school. And, and like every other Midwestern American, you just think like, oh, I'm going to grind out this job for the next 30 years of my life. Fortunately, God blessed me with the talent in athletics, particularly for fighting, and I had a successful career doing this. And suddenly, you know, I, I had never been on a plane prior to the age of 26. And uh, maybe last year I threw, I, I, last year I flew somewhere close to 300,000 miles just in one year. Um, and so when life completely just makes that U-turn, it's, it's, it's quite different. I, I, I truly feel like I'm a blessed individual because I, I really helped an industry grow in the West uh, during my, my career as an athlete. And now that I've retired, um, the Lord has blessed me with a good job with one championship. And I once again get to help an industry grow, but I'm working outside of the cage. And very few athletes get to experience that, especially being able to experience it on, on this side of the planet. Um, it's, it's completely different. There's no easy way out. I'm learning a lot of I'm learning I'm learning a lot of stuff about business in general. Uh, it's interesting because I bring a lot of business knowledge from my previous experiences to the table here, but at the same time, uh, the business that I'm that I'm bringing and the business that I'm developing is on a much larger scale. So I'm using this little bit of knowledge that I have to, and at the same time, I'm just expanding knowledge. But learning how how things work culturally over here um, when you, when you're conducting business is quite interesting. And I think that. Probably by the time that my my little venture is is done, if, whether I spend you know five years working over here or twenty five years working over here, I will have probably learned enough business knowledge in Asia just to kind of get myself in trouble or mess things up. <laughs> so, uh, but it's you know every day I'm I'm one of those people, and I think this is my my background in education that kind of makes me this way. Is I'm just one of those people who I enjoy the learning process along the way. Like I I learn something new, I refine it, I make myself a better individual in pretty much every aspect of life. And so I'm doing the same thing with, with business here. And, and I'm, like I said, I'm just blessed to be able to experience this on a daily basis. Picking up on a couple of, couple of things you just said, yeah. uh, but, but moving on to a different angle, there's something I've always been fascinated in. I know it's a bit of a cliche question, so forgive me if I ask it, but I really want to know your particular angle. As a man of faith, has it always been for you a, a, an interesting dynamic entering into an arena where you may possibly cause harm against another person when the teachings of the Bible say there's something different. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Um, and even within, I'm not sure if you're a man of faith or not, but in, within, this, within these circles of, of, we'll say Christianity or whatever, you, t you, you find Christians that fall into one or two categories, either those people who understand or those people who do not understand. L let, me, let me start this answer by telling you a story. There was a day when I was, I was teaching... Um, when I was teaching and I was sitting in the teacher's lounge on my plan bell and I was grading some papers 
and I'd finished grading some papers. And um, I oftentimes, would, I had a Bible at my school. I would leave a Bible at my school. And, and so when I had some free time, I would sit and read my Bible. I actually, believe it or not, I, I actually enjoy reading the Bible. It's kind of hard for people to look at you like you're crazy. Uh, there's some great, great stuff to learn, some great stories and whatever. And so one of the students walked in and asked me, hey, what are you reading? And so immediately I kind of like, there was just this gut feeling like, oh, I'm not allowed to share this. It's, you know, especially in the States, there's this big separation of church and state. And I remember at the time, I remember praying and I said, you know, God, if you just, if you gave me a job where I could share my faith with, um, with young kids without the fear of losing my job, that'd be great. And so... I'm not saying that God pushed me in the direction of becoming a fighter, but, you know, because we make our own choices, but pretty much like, I make my own choices, and it's God's way of saying, like, okay, if this is what you want to do, I'm just going to, you know, you ask, so I'm going to use it to uh, to glorify me. And uh, and so what ended up happening is I had a job where I had a platform to speak to, to children as a teacher, and then suddenly I have a new job where I have a platform to be able to speak to children on a much larger scale as a professional athlete. And so, you know, when, when I run into Christians, I see certain Christians who are like, you know what, that's great that you have this platform to be able to talk about your faith and things like that. And then I run into other Christians who say, well, I don't know how you can call yourself a Christian when your job is about violence. Um, to those kind of people, I say, you know, when you look at things that are violent, like truly, like I step into a cage and it's not about hatred or anger or anything like that for me. Um, I'm particularly there to do a job and prove that I can do a job better than the guy standing across from me. Unfortunately, when I'm throwing punches at somebody, people have a very difficult time understanding that. But to that person, I always say, you know, you see American football players who will profess their faith, um, particularly an outside linebacker whose job is to come across the line of scrimmage and try to literally kill the quarterback if he can every play. But if that guy says something like, you know, praise God at the end of the game, it's not that big of a deal. How is that job any different than mine, really? And uh, and, th and that's how I feel about it. You know, it's all it's all about the intention of things. So, yeah. it's a perfect answer. Thank you so much. And by the way, I fall into the first category. By the way, but it's just a question that I often get yeah. asked myself, and I find it a very interesting dynamic. And I find that questions are just opportunities to give stories like that. So, thank absolutely. You. Um, how often do you get back to go back to Ohio? Um, and 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 how's how's it uh, how's it on the family? Um, I, I, well, I, let me just say this. So I started, I've been working for one for a little over three years now. And, uh, I just moved to Singapore full time in January. I go back, uh, about once a quarter for a several week trip at a time, because when I got hired on full time, well, I've been working full time. Don't get me wrong from, but I've been working remotely from the States. Uh, the nature of the job is, has changed tremendously now that I'm here because I'm in the office on a regular basis and traveling to every event and whatnot. But um, but I go back once a quarter for several weeks on end and because I have things going on back in the States, like I'd invested in property that I have to keep an eye on. I invested in, in some restaurants that I go back for quarterly meetings on and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I pretty much make that trip home like once a quarter just to, to make, make sure I stay connected. Do they still have Rich Franklin Day in Cincinnati? It's, it, I, don't, I don't think that's a perpetual thing, or if it is, there's not some sort of great celebration that, uh, that they have on, a, on an annual basis. I should, I should start some, some sort of Cincinnati tradition or whatever. Um, it's another general one, and something I feel passionate as a, as a, as, as a, an, an MMA fan and journalist and producer. What do you think makes MMA the greatest sport on the planet? Uh, it's, I, I believe it's, it's, it's pure, it's about as pure as you can get. Um, and, and I mean this by, the word pure that I'm talking about is from a few different aspects. For example, when, when I think of myself as an athlete and many of the athletes that I know, when you're into, like, th there are several wrestlers that have transitioned into mixed martial arts. And that's probably growing up about the closest thing, that or boxing closest thing that you can come to as far as uh, as a sport that may transition into. Those kind of athletes, or even you know somebody like myself who didn't come from that background, you're not treated like the mainstream athlete who may be the state high school winning quarterback or the, the you know the state high school winning pitcher or whatever. I mean, these kids, they, they can skip classes in high school and that 
that pattern starts early on through college and these are the guys that sign for millions and millions of dollars like when you're a great athlete like from the age of 13 on or something you're groomed into this thing and, and you, you kind of you have this position of entitlement and uh athletes in, in this sport in mixed martial arts they're not that way they come from these very humble backgrounds many of them are from poor inner city areas they things grew up rough and even when you became good at something like boxing or wrestling it wasn't one of those popular main mainstream three sports and so you weren't treated with that same reverence as every other athlete and you'll, you'll find that when you meet a lot of mixed martial artists they stay uh, a bit more humble they're you know it's like man you're just like a regular guy I can hang out with you there's whereas when you meet a, a, a top-notch athlete if you met a world champion level athlete in any other sport um, the, they would probably be a bit more disconnected because they, like I said, they've had this position of entitlement the whole time. And so that's one thing of, uh, of purity. I think the, the other thing I was talking about when I talked about something of purity is that the competition is as close to as raw as, as you can get. I mean, it's, you know, even even the system of, of, of boxing, there are many, many rules and you're limited to many things you can't do. I mean, just on the most basic level, I, I wouldn't be able to kick my opponent if I was boxing. Um, now, I don't want to, create the image that mixed martial arts doesn't have any rules because it's quite complex but it is it is as close to pure as you can get when you're when, when you're trying to keep your athletes protected and whatnot and i think that that the purity of that competition it just has something that, that people can connect to yeah completely i've always felt the very same way it's almost like it's competition distilled where there's no there's no pig's bladders there's no there's no lines there's no lens of grass there's no all these rules it's take take all the way away the rules have rules of decency obviously like small yeah. time flesh and stuff like that but just have one person again one person for me that's almost like a metaphor for life and the metaphor does strike into what you're talking about in terms of these people's backgrounds right? absolutely you have this thing where you can you know you can be pummeled for three rounds in the last 30 minutes 30 seconds of round three you can pull out a fantastic submission that's a metaphor yeah. of never giving up for life and that's why i find it so for, for, and that's a perfect example we had um uh which card was this it was a couple of cards ago when uh, Luis Santos fought uh, Sebastian Kadastam. And I mean, Sebastian was just getting run over for two and a half rounds. And about midway through the third round, Luis just ran out of gas. And I mean, just like that, it took like one or two strikes. And that fight completely changed direction. And then Kadastam won, won, won the fight and it was stopped. And it's just like, you're exactly right. That's how, that's how life can go. And then life is that way. So people, people relate to it. And I think just on the purity thing, we're talking about like humble beginnings and all that stuff. It's the same thing. I mean, you see people, oftentimes sports, I mean, even to like, you know, my, my, my young nephew, he plays uh, football growing up. I mean, you have to have, there's, there's an entry cost to that. There are lots of equipment that you have to pay and team fees and all that. And, you know, with things like boxing and wrestling and, and MMA and whatnot, you can get into these, the barrier of entry is easy, you know, and, uh, and so, you see a lot more of those humble beginnings of people who grew up really poor and had to struggle through life. And I think that when you talk about, like what I talked about, about a fight being a metaphor for life and what you mentioned, it's the same way around. Like life, your life struggle becomes a metaphor for what happens inside the cage because you struggle all the same. And if you're used to overcoming that adversity your whole life, growing up in bad neighborhoods and being poor your whole life and whatnot, and things just aren't handed to you, then you have that mentality already when you go into, when you go, when you step in the cage. So talking about humble beginnings, let's talk about great futures. What's, what's the future for Rich Franklin? And I don't know, I, I, we started at, at the beginning of this conversation, we started talking about graduating from a high school that had cornfields on three sides of it. And, um, and yeah, there are a few things I've learned in life. And one of them is that the moment that you think you have your future mapped out, it's going to go completely in the opposite direction. So, uh, so who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm here now. I'm helping an industry grow. I spent um, 15 years doing that in the States. And so who knows how long I'll be doing this here. And, uh, and I, I think the future for one championship, I really think that we just hit the tip of the iceberg at this point in time. And, uh, and there's a lot of growth potential here still. And, and so I, got, I have a lot of work to do, and I'm, and I'm happy doing the work that I'm doing. So if you said, where do you think you'll be 10 years from now? I, I have no clue, honestly. I just, you know, I could, I could go one direction and say I could just be sipping and drinking some coconut water on a beach relaxing because my work is done. But I know me, and, and the moment that I've climbed this mountain, if it, if it takes less than 10 years, there will be a new mountain for me to climb. 
Beautiful, Rich. Thank you so much. Really You're appreciate welcome. it. Yeah, anytime. Thank you, mate. Yeah. Well, that's your lot for this week's episode of The Clinch. Don't forget you can get hold of us through all the usual social media accounts. If there's anything whatsoever that you want to share or you want to see, please do get hold of us. Join me next week for more insight, features, and interviews. Thanks for watching. Be good. <laughs>